next on Unsolved Mysteries. An airline pilot vanishes, leaving a trail of wives, children, and scandal across the country. This cab driver is turned into a human time bomb and then forced to rob a bank. A sheriff is shot while on patrol. Before dying, he's able to describe his attacker's car. Is it enough to catch a killer? And is there a vast underground river in the dry desert of Nevada? A former NASA scientist claims satellite photos led him to this amazing discovery. Murder, missing persons, wanted fugitives, and the paranormal. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Jack and Caroline Lutter had known each other for two years before they were married. Jack was a pilot for United Airlines, Caroline a marine biologist. Then one day, Jack vanished into thin air. I was married to Jack for six years and we were together for eight years. And for most of those years, it was a very happy time. And over time, I grew more and more in love with him, which I thought was impossible to do. I tried to understand the fact that he was a pilot, and yes, pilots are gone away from home a lot. And so many times, if he'd tell me he'd be home the next day and he didn't show up, I would cry and be in tears, because I planned my weekends for him to come home. For four weeks, Jack didn't call, and Caroline had no idea where he had gone. The situation became more serious when their son Jonathan was diagnosed with a hernia and needed immediate surgery. Caroline called the airline to try to find Jack. When she spoke to his supervisor, she got news she never expected. Other women had also been calling about Jack Lutter. It was a terrible feeling. I felt very betrayed, extremely betrayed. And after loving him so deeply all these years, I felt that my love for him had been violated. I found out that every single thing he told me were lies. I found out that there was many, many, many women in his life. Some of those women were not just girlfriends. In fact, they were actually married to Jack Lutter. His deception played out in six condos and six houses with six wives and at least 15 children. Lutter initially met each of his wives through chance encounters. One of them, Fatima, fell under his spell on an airport bus in Seattle. Gee, there aren't many people on this bus. I wasn't thinking that he was attractive at all. It's just that he was very friendly. So I was looking at him, it just seems like a, a very nice person. And then he offered his phone number and he asked for my phone number. Just a few months later, Fatima and Jack Lutter were married in Reno she unknowingly became his fifth wife. They moved to San Francisco where they had two children. I don't get much opportunity to have a social life. Lutter didn't marry every woman that he dated. Teresa was a common law wife. They met in Denver, had a child, and then he moved her to El Paso. Like his other wives, Teresa needed a job to make ends meet. We were gonna spend the rest of our lives together. So I never believed he was unfaithful. And he always said that he always hated people that get divorced because he doesn't believe in divorce. Once Lutter disappeared, his wives began calling each other. Teresa and Caroline began by piecing together the true story of Lutter's numerous marriages. His fifth wife, Fatima, investigated a condominium in San Francisco where Lutter's grandfather supposedly lived. There was no grandfather. 
But Fatima did find the secret stash of Lutter's personal belongings, including explicit sexual photos of his many wives. The whole thing it was like a nightmare. It was really hard for me to look at the pictures, and it was really hard that I could find out that I was not the only woman. This man is just practicing the same thing that he's saying. It's just no meaning to it. Knowing that letter always left his car at the airport, Caroline took a spare set of keys and searched it. In the trunk, she found checks and mortgage receipts for various properties he owned all over the country. Not only did he have other women, but he had lied to me about his uh, financial situation, too. For him never to have supported me at all in all these eight years, to have borrowed money from me only to turn, turn around and use my money to pay these mortgage payments. And I knew that many of these mortgage payments were for wives or women living in these homes. And it was my money that he was using to support some of the other women. That, I was extremely angry at that. Caroline packed up Lutter's belongings, filed a missing persons report, and asked the police to investigate her suspicions of bigamy. To me, it's unbelievable. The farther I got into the case, the more aghast I was at the, the job that this guy had to do. Yeah, but they just told me. I just. He I never just missed anniversaries out. or holidays or birthdays or anything for his children or his wives. It's unbelievable Hi, sweetheart. capacity that this man has oh, yeah. for detail yeah. and his abilities no, to disengage himself from one family entirely and re-engage himself with another family and take up as if he hadn't been gone at all. Jack Lauder's wives all lived in cities on his airplane routes. His scam had worked perfectly until he was promoted. And then his routes suddenly changed. His complex web of lies began to unravel. Lutter vanished, and for six weeks, none of his wives heard from him. Then, in the middle of the night, Lutter called Caroline. He said that he was calling from a payphone inside a Cuban prison, where he had been held captive after being shipwrecked off the Cuban coast. Caroline knew that he was lying, but she pretended to believe him. Two days later, Lutter called from the airport. Caroline had planned to alert the police, but that night she decided to confront him first. Hi, honey, how are you? She insisted that they talk in a public place, so they drove to a restaurant near the airport. I want to talk to you. What about these women? By the end of their conversation, Caroline did not have the heart to turn Jack in. There's a woman in San Francisco, and I know there's also this other woman in Sacramento. Who are they? What I saw in front of me was a man whose whole life had just broken apart. And to me, he was like a wounded, cornered animal, not willing to admit to the truth. We spent the weekend together, and on Monday, he said he was going to go try and salvage whatever he could with his job, and I took him to the airport. Lutter walked down the ramp and out of Caroline's life forever. And then he simply went to one of his other wives. For six months, he lived in El Paso with Teresa. And although she knew about the other women, she didn't turn him in either. Lutter was fired by the airline, and then he disappeared again. I know why Jack has done what he has done. I know when he did it and for how long, and I know what the results are. What I don't know is where he is right now. That's the mystery. Update. Jack Lutter was finally captured after he was spotted at Los Angeles International Airport. He was taken to Seattle and convicted of bigamy. He served his sentence of 90 days and was released on probation, but he disappeared, violating probation, and he failed to make court payments. A warrant for the arrest of Jack Lutter has been issued by a Seattle court. Jack Lutter is six feet two inches tall and weighs about 200 pounds. 
If you have seen Blutter, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, a cab driver is wired with explosives and forced to participate in a bizarre robbery scheme. Modesto, California. 65-year-old Harvey McLeod had been driving a cab for 10 years and had seen just about everything. So he wasn't too surprised when a man in a turban with a phony beard and mustache flagged him down one afternoon. It was just a normal fare. He did have a turban, but we have several of those in Modesto, so I never thought anything about it. Uh, I'm going up to Jamestown. Hey, that's a 50-minute ride. That'll run you $90. I'll have to get that up front. The passenger spoke in a coarse whisper. He only had about half the fare, but he said he could pick up the rest at his brother's house, which was on the way. I have to stop by my brother's place and pick up the rest. Stop by your brother's house. All right. Yeah, just keep driving east. Um, we'll take a left right up here. Lit Road? That's right. But he said his brother lived on Lit Road, so I didn't think too much about it until he told me to stop after a couple of blocks. And so I stopped the car and turned around and here that gun was staring me right in the nose. Do exactly what I tell you. Cut the wires to the radio transmitter and get out that door. So I, I just basically thought it was a robbery. But this was no ordinary robbery. In fact, the mysterious passenger was not going to take any of Harvey McLeod's money. He had bigger plans. His first step was to turn Harvey McLeod into a human time bomb. The gunman chained a black metal box with a numeric keypad onto Harvey's stomach. He ran a wire lead around his neck and clipped it shut. And then he activated the black box. You do exactly what I say and you'll be all right. You screw up at all, you'll die. And the bomb is remote controlled. All I have to do is dial a number on my cell phone. You're gone. I was terrified. Well, my mind was going 100 miles an hour, and I was trying to figure out how am I going to get out of this. Ten minutes later, Harvey was on his way back to Modesto. You're going to rob a bank. I want you to listen to me very carefully. There's a second bomb in this box. I want you to take this briefcase and the bomb into the bank. I want you to leave the bomb in the bank when you're done. You understand me? Yep. Well, he kept reminding me that he could set this bomb off by his cellular telephone. And me, I don't know that much about electronics, but what you see, you know, in papers and TV, you can do about anything with electronics nowadays, so I believe. I need to see the bank manager. Uh, sorry, sir, she's unavailable. You just have a seat. I need to see the bank manager now. It's important. Sir, excuse me. Please, just have a seat. I need to see the bank manager. It cannot please. wait. I, I understand that, of Is course. Is there a problem? I need to see the manager. Are you the manager? I am. May I help you? I thought I was dealing with an irate customer because he was agitated. I proceeded to read the letter, and about midway through, it, it shocked me, and it upset me. Did you read this? Look what he did to me. I looked around the lobby, saw how busy we were, and it was very scary that if I didn't do the right thing, that all of us could be blown up as a result of that. The bank manager and another employee filled the briefcase with the exact amount of money demanded Ten. in the letter. Ten. And then Harvey performed a quiet act of heroism. I didn't want to see innocent people get killed. I couldn't do much about me, but I could at least take the bomb with me and to protect the other people in the bank. So I walked out the door with it. In the back of the cab, Harvey found a list of instructions. First, he drove to a hardware store and parked the cab, leaving behind the cash and the car keys. And then he walked half a mile to a payphone. 
The instructions said the gunman would phone with directions for dismantling the bomb. I waited about five, ten minutes, and no call came in, so I went over and happened to look at the telephone, and it said no incoming calls. So then I knew that something was up. So then that's when I called my dispatcher and told her what happened. Within minutes, the police were on the scene, and the area was being evacuated. Harvey McLeod sat alone in the eye of the storm. And they say I looked calm, but I wasn't very calm inside. I, I was shaking, and my stomach was rolling, and, and I had all these things going through my mind, and I just wondered how long I was going to be there in this old world. Eventually, the bomb squad arrived and released Harvey from the device. X-rays determined that both bombs were fakes. There's a package back here. Let's get this roped off. The robbery had been perfectly executed, almost. When the gunman was dropped off across the street from the bank, there were two witnesses that observed a male adult that was unusually dressed. They thought at first that um, since there was a bank in close proximity, that possibly someone was having a, a birthday party and they hired this person to do some type of uh, gig for them <laughs> inside of the bank. When this person reached the van, he took off a turban as well as dark sunglasses and a fake beard and mustache. And the secondary thought that the male witness had was maybe this person had just robbed a bank. However, the two eyewitnesses were unable to provide police with a license plate number. This case is still unsolved. The statute of limitations has expired on the robbery, but not on the kidnapping. Witnesses describe the suspect as about six feet tall and 160 pounds. The man has short cropped hair that is silver or salt and pepper in color. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a woman who provides shelter for homeless dogs is terrorized by a mysterious assailant. Monterr, Missouri. This 110-acre farm is Mabel Wood's dream come true. Mabel is a dog lover, so much so that she set up a sanctuary in the country for dogs that would otherwise have been impounded and possibly put to sleep. She built a $60,000 kennel to house her 115 dogs. The dogs were offered for adoption, but those that didn't find new homes lived out their lives on the sanctuary. Mabel felt that the farm was an ideal location because her nearest neighbors were over a mile away and would not be disturbed by the dogs. But 18 months after she moved to the farm, Mabel's peaceful life was shattered. One night, someone broke into her kennel. The intruder fired at least four rounds from a 22 caliber rifle, killing two dogs and seriously wounding two others. The next morning, when I went up to open the kennel, I found my dogs dead. In the beginning, I thought, oh, there's been a fight. They killed each other. But as I looked, I, I realized that they had been shot. He was shot right in the nose. It's, it's a miracle that he's even living because he was laying in a pool of blood when I found him. I was upset about it, and I called the sheriff's office, but I knew there was nothing, really nothing, that could be done at that point, probably. Police investigated the shooting, but because the killing of an animal is only a misdemeanor, the case was given a low priority. After the shooting, Mabel hired a man named Charlie Jacobs to help out around the kennel. Charlie moved into the guest house and doubled as a hired hand and night watchman. Come here, girl. For two months, nothing unusual happened. Mabel and Charlie settled into a comfortable routine. 
And then one night, Charlie was in his kitchen when he noticed a bright orange glow through the window. The kennel was on fire. By the time Charlie reached the kennel, it was engulfed in flames. Inside were 60 dogs. They had no way to escape. It was awful. Flames were real high. And you hear a few yipes every once in a while. And the place is on fire. I mean, it's like an inferno. Charlie managed to pull only one dog from the flames but could do nothing to save the others. <laughs> there was no reason for the kennel to burn because the kennel was so new, a great deal of it was green lumber. I knew it had to be arson because the dogs were blazing, which they would not have been without something put on them. The fire was so intense that it set off smoke alarms in homes over a mile away. Have you had any problems with anyone recently? No, we haven't. Have you noticed anybody around the property? As I watched the kennel come down to the ground and realized that my dogs were all dead, I just couldn't realize why anyone would do that. There just wasn't anything left except a few scraps of metal in the concrete. The local volunteer fire department began an investigation. We wanted to clean off the debris of the, the barn to get a look at the floor we started to see a pattern that's called spalding. Spalling occurs when a flammable substance is ignited on concrete. The extreme heat causes the concrete to crack or erode. This pattern is not normal in a fire. It led to, to the assumption that the fire was set with a flammable liquid. We believe that night that the suspect entered the building through the, the door they used normally to get between the two rows of pins. <laughs> he entered the building, poured a flammable liquid down the walls as he went in. The hallway led to a bigger open area at the far end. He continued pouring the wall. At that point, that's probably when he lit it, and then he took off. One hundred yards from where the kennel once stood, police found a tire track in the mud. Somebody left out in a hurry. This track and the spalling patterns burnt into the kennel floor are the only evidence police have in this case. That's radio wind. We don't have any leads. Don't have any suspects that haven't been eliminated. Most of the people that you find in this part of the country are dog lovers. We have dogs. We have hunting dogs. We care a lot about our dog. There's people in this county who would shoot you a whole lot quicker over their dog than they would their wife. Within 10 months of the fire, Mabel had built a new kennel. Our concern for Mabel's safety is an ongoing thing. We keep an eye on that lady. We keep an eye on her property. Despite this protection, the harassment continued. Someone spread nails across Mabel's driveway. Her house was shot at twice. Finally, a warning was painted on Mabel's property. It said, quiet or die. Here we go. Here we go. But Mabel stood her ground. I thought about it, and I decided this was a perfect farm. It's, it's very pretty. I've got the creek, which I love. I decided I am not going to leave. It is my farm. I bought it, paid for it and I'm staying. The person who burned down Mabel's kennel has never been caught and the case is still open. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, 
Controversy surrounds a former NASA scientist who claims he's found the vast, untapped water supply in the middle of the Nevada desert. Deep in the desert of Nevada. In 1927, a prospector named Earl Doerr was lured to this unforgiving wilderness by an old Indian legend. It told of a secret cavern leading to an underground river that sparkled with nuggets of gold. Earl Doerr was just crazy enough to believe that he could find it. According to a story Earl later published, he and a friend eventually found the secret opening and squeezed through it. He described a treacherous 3,500-foot descent into a murky underground canyon where they found the legendary river. Earl said they explored for four days. They followed the river for eight miles and found vast amounts of gold. What he's describing is something like the world's largest natural underground sluice, where light rocks are carried away by the water and the heavier minerals, like your gold, your platinum group metals, rare earths, would be settling out and concentrating. So it's almost kind of a too good to be true thing. Earl claimed that the rich black sand contained 100 ounces of gold per cubic yard. But Earl had one very big problem. Someone else owned the land at the entrance to the cavern. Earl thought that he could find another way in, so he decided to close the original opening. But Earl never did find another entrance to the underground river. Others would follow in his path, but the location of the legendary river seemed lost forever. Decades later, a former NASA scientist named Wally Spencer was examining photographs of the Nevada desert taken from space. He spotted what he believed was an ancient river channel, bone dry for 500 million years. He believed that plants would have flourished along such a river and over millions of years may have decomposed into crude oil. Wally built a prospecting device from common laboratory instruments. He based his design on two simple facts. First, the Earth naturally emits a low level of radiation. Second, a large subsurface pool of liquid, such as oil, will block this radiation. Wally believed that his mobile radiation detector could find a hidden reservoir of oil. With the help of his wife and son, Wally put it to the test. For three weeks, they bounced across the sands, waiting for the device to react. Whoa, Barry, stop, stop, hold it, hold it. We went off scale, I don't know, something happened, we went totally off scale. He was hoping for oil, but further testing indicated that they had actually found water, perhaps the same river Earl Dorr had talked about half a century before. It was very disappointing when we found out it wasn't oil, because once we started landing, it looked like the river. <laughs> Everybody says, hey, you found the river. You didn't find a pocket of oil. Very disappointing, but it was so large that uh, it had to be exciting. Wally estimated the flow could be an incredible 17 billion gallons a day. There is enough water for 170 gallons a day for 100 million people. Now that has got to be something that is extremely of interest to the Western United States, to Nevada, to our nation as a whole. In Nevada, water is as precious as gold. Wally Spencer was certain that he discovered a priceless resource, one that promised to make him rich. But Wally soon found himself in a bureaucratic standoff with the state of Nevada. Nevada law required that anyone drilling for water had to first apply for a permit, and that meant revealing the river's location. Before doing so, Wally asked the state officials to guarantee that he would receive a finder's fee, even though the state would own any water that he found. 
However, authorities insisted that Wally apply for a drilling permit just like anyone else. No promises, no guarantees. If I filed for appropriations permit, it could be denied on any kind of whimsical notion the state has, like not in the best interest of the people or not in the best interest of the state. They would own it. I would have nothing. There's nobody that's going to try to rob him of his water rights. There might be other speculators out here that try to, might also claim that he has priority if he files the proper documentation, and a lawyer can help him do that. You really think it's necessary to do all Wally and his wife, Wally. Beverly, were concerned that others might try to steal the secret of their find. They asked two experts to scan their house for bugs. According to Wally, the sophisticated equipment picked up a bug on the phone line. You see? It's the kind of thing we're talking about. Wally and Beverly also say that the investigators found a high-tech listening device hidden in their living room. They were trying to probably find out the location. We never discuss the location of the water. It's not in our vocabulary. So I don't know who did it. I don't know why they did it that they haven't gained from it. Scientists who have worked with Wally believe that he is totally credible, though Nevada state officials question his account. He has never revealed his technology. He can't show where the water's coming from. He can't show where the water's going. And he won't reveal the location. So it's not a lot different than the guy that's walking around the desert with a willow stick dousing for water, or the guy that's walking around the crust of the earth with a turquoise bead on a gold chain witching for water. Wally's one of the true scientist problem solvers that you can run into. He's the type of guy that doesn't run to the textbook to pull out the equation to solve the problem. He takes Newton's equations and he derives what he needs out of them to solve the problem. So he's a, a true scientist. You know, I'd like it to be true. I mean, I, I don't think you'll find anybody in Nevada that wants to find water resources like, uh, like Wally has described. But you have to be practical at the same time. And the way to be practical is just simple questions. Wally, what have you found with that technology? And the second thing is, let me see it. Update. Wally Spencer died in 2003. His wife, Beverly, has since filed 16 water rights applications, which are still pending. Beverly remains convinced there are 20 million acre feet of water running under the Nevada desert, beginning in British Columbia and emptying into the Pacific Ocean. Is there a huge river flowing beneath the desert in Nevada? While some say the idea is far-fetched, Wally's family believes it is only a matter of time before they'll find water. Next, a police officer is shot in cold blood and a bullet hole in a burnt out car leads police to the killer. Lee County, Virginia. In the early morning hours, patrolman John Martin, a 17 year veteran of the sheriff's department is making his regular rounds when he notices something unusual. 604 to Jonesville. Go ahead, 604. I'll be checking a parked vehicle out at the Western Lee County Health Clinic. John Martin reported to our dispatcher in Jonesville at 2.58 a.m. on the morning of November 4 that he was checking a car parked behind the Lee County Health Clinic in Ewing, Virginia. This vehicle just pulled out on me. And then he came back and said that the car was moving out on him, that he was stopping it about halfway down the driveway. And that was the last transmission that John Martin ever made. <laughs> Authorities believe that he left his patrol car and approached the driver to question him. See your operator's license, please. When I arrived 
Dennis location, I found Officer Martin lying in the driveway of the clinic. When I got to him, he told me, Doug, I've been shot and I'm hurt bad. I contacted the dispatcher and had a rescue squad dispatched. I knew at the point when I found him, he was probably critically injured and it was very important that I be able to maintain the scene and to be able to get what information I could from him while he was conscious. Did you see who did it or did you get a description of the vehicle? He was in his mid-twenties, had a mustache. I'd ask him about the automobile and about the tag. He could not read the registration numbers from the tag, but uh, he was able to give me a rough description of the vehicle as a Buick, light brown or tan, 1970 to 1977, perhaps one of the large Buicks. Martin was able to give Officer Parsons one final piece of information about the license plate. It read, Land of Lincoln, the motto for the state of Illinois. Did you shoot into the car or shoot anyone? Yes, I shot at the vehicle. He had advised me he had emptied his gun into the car. I checked his weapon and it was empty. He had fired all six rounds from his revolver. Martin was rushed to the nearest hospital 22 miles away. He had been shot three times. Doctors removed one 44 caliber bullet from his body, but he lapsed into a coma. Three days later, John Martin died. He was laid to rest with full honors. Hundreds of local residents and police officers from seven states came to pay their final respects. I just thought it wouldn't happen to him. We had talked about it, but it don't feel real. Out of this, we're hoping that we can possibly catch whoever done it. That's our main priority right now. That's all we want. The next day, police in Effingham, Illinois, impounded a stolen car burnt almost beyond recognition. Inside, they discovered evidence that indicated that this was the car used in John Martin's killing. The key, a bullet hole in the driver's side door. Authorities uncovered information that linked a 24-year-old man named David Wayne Mills to the car. When Mills arrived home, he was arrested. During questioning, Mills revealed the location of the 44 caliber pistol. Ballistics confirmed that it was the gun that killed John Martin. Update. A jury found David Wayne Mills guilty of first-degree murder in the shooting of John Martin. During the trial, Mills claimed that an accomplice fired the fatal shots, but the jury didn't buy it. David Wayne Mills was sentenced to life in prison, plus 15 years. On a previous broadcast, we profiled a young English woman named Delia Fossani. When Delia was 18 years old and unmarried, she gave birth to a baby and named her Michelle. Delia's father insisted that she stay at a convent until her baby was adopted. Two weeks after Michelle was born, Delia's parents visited the convent. Delia hoped that once her father saw the baby, that he would let Delia keep her. But he wouldn't even look at his granddaughter. In the end, Delia had no choice but to give up Michelle for adoption. You've only got 30 minutes to say goodbye. What you try to do is look at her face to burn the impression into your mind. But you're feeling her body because that was the last time you're going to see her. One minute I had a baby, the next minute it was gone. Two photographs were all that Dealey had to remember Michelle, and she never stopped trying to locate her. Delia eventually learned that her daughter had been renamed Laura. An adoption official agreed to send her a note that Delia had written. In the brief message, Delia asked Laura to watch her story on Unsolved Mysteries. On a chilly spring evening in 1964, 
In New York Mills, New York, on the evening of our broadcast, Delia's daughter, Laura Franklin, was watching. That was just the way they did things then. They just there she is. left the responsibility to go. When I found out my birth mother was searching for me, it was pretty touching to know that she had looked that far um, to try to find me. If you have any information, please call our toll-free number. After the broadcast, Laura contacted our phone center and asked to be put in touch with Delia. A few weeks later, Laura, her husband, their two children, and many friends assembled to greet Delia after a long flight. It was a lot of anticipation, a lot of what's she going to think when she sees me, and um, what is she going through right now? She was everything and more that I'd expected. Absolutely everything. She's a beautiful girl. Proud of her. Before Laura's adoptive mother died, she had shared all she knew about Laura's background. Delia and Laura could now fill in the remaining gaps in the nearly 30 years of family history. Finding my birth mother now, I don't think has really changed my life as much as it has probably enhanced it, because now I can find out some about my past and my history and things that I never thought that I would ever find out about. I can't replace her mother, but I'd like to think that I could be pretty close. This reunion was only the beginning. Laura and her family also made plans to travel to England to spend time with Delia and her many other new relatives. Many of the other cases are not yet resolved. If you have any information about any of the stories profiled on this program, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.